are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello. And welcome to this episode of Reality Scoop. Today, I have a very special guest with us today. It is Josh Cohen. He's a licensed marriage family therapist based here in West Hartford. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. So today, Josh is going to help us to become more mindful and present with some breathing techniques, as well as talk about the different modalities of therapy. So Josh, uh, welcome to the show again, and wanted to find out what made you become interested in becoming a licensed marriage family therapist? Mm. I think I was always curious about it from a young age. My grandfather was actually a marriage and family therapist, and I was very close with him growing up. Mm -hmm. So I often heard stories about his work, kind of saw how he interacted with people, and I always found myself drawn to that. And when I ended up going to the University of Connecticut, I uh, started majoring in psychology and family studies, and he was a big support of that. And uh, I just fell in love with those classes. I just felt like it aligned with who I was as a person and my personality. Okay. And uh, I ended up choosing marriage and family therapy after taking a few classes in it mm -hmm. and felt like it was just the best uh, style for me. Okay. And how long have you been um, a therapist? I've been practicing therapy for um, about five to six years. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the um, the techniques or modalities that you use? Mm -hmm. Uh, in my practice, I'd use a lot of research-based, short-term approaches. So I try and find resolutions as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. I'll use uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, mindfulness. I'll use family therapy techniques. Try to produce the results as fast as possible and as effective as possible. Okay. So uh, what are some of the apprehensions that you've seen with therapy? Uh, I know from my own personal experience mm -hmm. as an African-American woman, I've always grew up as uh, being told, don't put your business out in the streets, mm. uh, only Jesus can fix it. Mm. So um, when people actually decide to go outside of those uh, boundaries of whatever you know uh, cultural differences mm -hmm. that they may have of what they've been taught about therapy, um, what do you think helps people to really become comfortable with you and to kind of work around those mm. apprehensions. Right. Yeah, so to, to address like the first part of what you said, um, there are a lot of apprehensions around, you know, what the perception is of therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, you know, whether it's family-based, culture-based, or just an individual belief that you've come to, to uh, adopt, uh, there's definitely uh, a social perception here. Are they going to be perceived as crazy when they walk through my door? Mm -hmm. uh, does their family not want any secrets to get out? Right. Does their culture not want any secrets to get out? Did they not want any secrets to get out? Right. Um, so the first thing is when they actually do take the step, you know, I definitely congratulate them and applaud them for coming through because that is a big step. It is. Um, after they feel comfortable, I'll implement, you know, the modalities that I spoke about before. Mm -hmm. So what... What do you think um, you look for when you want to start to see results? Um, can you give us maybe some examples of people that you've treated and when you know you've kind of broken through to them? Hmm. That's a good question. You know, the first indicators, they, they'll tell it to you. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll try and work with them to clarify, you know, very realistically and specifically what their goals are. Mm -hmm. And as we start going towards those goals, you know, they'll start to notice different things and I'll ask them, you know, okay, so, you know, how close do you feel like you are to your goals? Mm -hmm. um, and they'll tell me, and those little signs are, are indicators. But um, thinking back, there was a guy I saw a few years ago. Um, 
he, when I saw him, he was in his late 50s. Okay. When he was a teenager, he witnessed a very, very traumatic event that pretty much steered his life completely off track. Mm. Uh, what ended up happening was uh, he ended up having nightmares every night, flashbacks every day. He ended up turning to substances mm -hmm. to kind of cope with the trauma that he'd experienced in and out of jail. By the time I saw him, he had seen, you know, 10, 15 therapists, you know, every time he was out of jail or, you know, whatever, someone was telling him to go to therapy. When I saw him, he was still having nightmares every single night mm. at the same time every single night. So he would decide to go maybe a week without sleeping to avoid the nightmares. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting. You know, I mean, the specifically the same time every single night to have a nightmare. Um, so I worked with him. And the first step was really to just find a way to get to this guy, mm -hmm. to get through to him. And um, we worked hard. You know, I used uh, different techniques I know and different, you know, uh, used humor and other styles to kind of not be judgmental yeah. and to be unconditional and to connect with him. Right. And once I was able to break through, mm -hmm. um, we did some strategic techniques, some mindfulness stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used to wear black every day. It was almost like he, he was, was in mourning. Yeah, I would he say, was, yeah. I would say, because the trauma experience was the death of mm. someone very close to him. And um, one day he walked in my office wearing white. Wow. And uh, it was it was an indicator to me that things had shifted. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, I remember before we discharged, he ended up having I think a couple weeks in a row without the nightmare. Wow. It was amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. So um, in order to kind of uh, penetrate and get through, you kind of have to be, uh, like you said, unconditional, but almost like a friend, mm -hmm. right? In order to mm -hmm. get people to open up. Right. Yeah, there's a fine line between, mm -hmm. you know, bonding too close, like becoming a friend yeah. and just kind of, and, and also keeping like the professional, professional. title yeah. kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, there are, everyone is unique and mm -hmm. everyone's experience is unique. So, you know, you do have to modify your approaches to bond with somebody mm -hmm. um, to each person. Yeah, so when, does uh, medication become necessary? Mm. Because I'm um, a, an advocate for going without mm. prescription drugs if you can, mm -hmm. but when do you know it's needed and how do you handle that? Yeah, I, I work closely with a few psychiatrists, mm -hmm. so I will definitely refer out if I feel like it is necessary and mm -hmm. if the uh, client themselves really f desire to have medication. Some people are like yourself where they do not want to take medication, mm -hmm. other people really do want to check out that route. Um, for some severe forms of anxiety, some severe forms of uh, actually more of ADHD, depression, mm -hmm. OCD, and some psychotic disorders like uh, schizophrenia, oh, yeah. uh, medication seems to be the most effective okay. in addition to therapy. In addition to therapy, um, yeah, because the two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, research has shown that you know medication with therapy is most effective than um, in those cases, mm -hmm. more than just, you know, one independently. Independently, okay. And um, so when um, you work with the most traumatic cases that you can think of, mm. when is it reasonable to see results? Like maybe six months, a year, mm. two years? Mm. Yeah, for, for a very traumatic case, um, you can actually surprisingly start to see results rather quickly. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? D depending on their history, depending on their present circumstances and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the right approaches, with, you know, the right connection and relationship building and, and everything, you can see results pretty quickly, you know, within 12 sessions, I would say. Mm. Um, okay. You know, there could be obviously uh, follow-up sessions after the 12 and, you know, continued improvement. But you can see results pretty quickly, even in the most traumatic uh, of cases. Okay. And so when you talk about um, being helping people to become mindful and using uh, different techniques, mm -hmm. let's talk about that briefly. Okay. What are some of the breathing techniques that you like to use? Okay. You know, I, I work with a lot of clients with high anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. high levels of stress. Their mind is racing. They can't turn it off. They can't sleep. They can't focus at work because they're highly distracted. So one thing I use is, is just some basic breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. um, there's one technique in particular that I, you know, usually start off with, uh, with clients. After I, you know, initiate them to that, I will typically use some meditation with them, some mm -hmm. other breathing techniques, um, some other strategic approaches. But um, this technique is called the four seven eight. Okay. It's uh, it's as simple as the name. 
four is how long you breathe in your nose, okay. seven is how long you hold your breath, mm -hmm. and eight is how long you breathe out your mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I could show you if you would like. Yeah, I would love to show that to the viewers. Okay, okay, great. So I'll count, and when I say in, you'll breathe in your nose. When I say hold, you'll hold your breath, and when I say out, you'll go out your mouth. Okay. We could do it two times. Okay. Okay? So when you're ready. Do I have to close my eyes? Or? Um, it's up to you. Okay. Some people like to do it with their eyes closed because they feel more comfortable. Okay, I will. Okay. So we'll go in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven seven, eight, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I feel better. Mm. Yeah, more yeah. relaxed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like a natural tranquilizer mm -hmm. in, in a sense. Um, the idea is to do it four times in a row. We mm -hmm. only did it two. Um, and you can do it throughout the day. You can do it a hundred times a day. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great technique I use to just kind of help people to get more in their body, more in the moment, and less with the, uh, the intense anxiety and racing thoughts that they experience. Right, yeah, because definitely you have to be focused and present mm -hmm. when you're breathing. So it definitely helps to calm and center you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep, so um, also wanted to talk about um, what are the, the most common problems that you are seeing lately. Mm. You said you work with people who are high anxiety, ADHD. Yeah, I, I would say um, just what you said, a high anxiety. Mm -hmm. A lot of clients come in and they're burnt out. Mm -hmm. They have stress at work, they have stress in their relationship, they have stress in, with parenting, their health, their finances. They're overwhelmed. Right. So they come to me, they're anxious, they, they just don't feel like themselves. And um, depression is another thing that's a consequence of that. So yes. a lot of anxiety and depression. And it seems to affect every part of their life. It does. Uh, I think because people uh, get overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, with a, a lot of uh, stressors at work, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel that maybe technology and social media mm -hmm. uh, play into that? Does that mm -hmm. add to the stressors? Um, it, it really depends on the situation and the circumstance and the person. Um, some instances I have found that technology actually, you know, in some ways makes it worse. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, some clients just, they never disconnect from technology. Okay. And, um, you know, some people that have, you know, business jobs and stuff are always checking their emails, mm -hmm. even at home. So they really bring ho work home, home with them. Home with them, yeah. Um, then there are also the people that just don't get off their phones, that don't ever, you know, get present in what they're doing with the people that they're with. And that just promotes more anxiety, more worry. Um, I think I heard that, you know, people have to check their phones every eight seconds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because it's definitely uh, addicting. Yeah. And it's like becoming almost an item uh, uh, as significant as a person's wallet. Mm -hmm. You know, remember that commercial back in the day, it says the American Express, mm -hmm. you don't leave home without oh, it. Yeah. So now it's the phone, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, the tablet. Mm -hmm. And um, so people are definitely hooked on these um, insignificant items. Mm -hmm. uh, Want to talk about briefly managed care. Mm. How does that play in how much you can help people? Because I'm just going to put out the premise that with uh, Obamacare, mm -hmm. do you think that it's helped people or hindered people in their progress uh, with therapy? Mm. It really, it, it really depends on the plan. There are mm -hmm. so many different plans that people have, mm -hmm. um, but you know, healthcare is not cheap. So for someone to not have the coverage and have to pay out of pocket, it's gonna be very, very tough to get right. their needs met by their clinicians. Um, it works for some, but it doesn't work for others. Um, but managed care, um, in some ways it can be helpful because they're looking in some ways, they're not, they're not allowing for very long-term uh, therapy they're mm -hmm. not going to look to reimburse you for a thousand sessions or something like right. that so you have to use the most effective research-based short-term approaches when you have a client in front of you mm -hmm. um, but it does there are certain diagnoses that they might not support um, so some people might not get the help and some right. people may have gotten therapy in the past and want to do it again and they're not going to approve of it mm -hmm. um, so it can put some clients in a tough situation yes I would I would think so um, 
especially now that managed care is almost dictating mm. um, how much help you can have. Uh, how do you circumvent that? It, let's say um, I've reached my maximum benefit where mm -hmm. uh, I'm only allowed 12 sessions. Mm -hmm. Do you then have to appeal to the healthcare mm -hmm. provider and say, look, this person needs an extended amount of right. treatment? I will typically have to fill out certain forms, certain authorizations for mm -hmm. clients if they ever reach that point mm -hmm. to you know, explain to the companies that you know, this client does need my, tr my uh, treatment still mm -hmm. because of the diagnosis and I'll have right. to yeah, I will have to kind of, uh, you know, have a relationship with the insurance companies in that way. And how successful have you been? I've actually been pretty successful. Mm -hmm. um, it does take some time and it, it, it does take some effort, but I have actually been pretty successful in that. Okay. And so um, what's the percentage that you've actually had to appeal to mm -hmm. managed care? Um, it hasn't been that much, actually, okay. surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, however, I have encountered uh, situations where clients' insurance has changed, their deductibles go up, right. they go to another uh, insurance company or something, mm -hmm. and they can't afford the services anymore. Right. Or I'm not paneled with their insurance company. I was going to say, you're out of network. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it, it's really tough to just sever a relationship halfway yeah, through treatment exactly. because of that. Mm -hmm. um, because that actually um, can deter people mm -hmm. from continuing treatment. Right. Then they you know, go backwards mm -hmm. instead of moving forwards right. with their care. So that can actually be a big issue. Mm -hmm. So um, has, uh, I would say, what has been your experience with the predominant patients that you see are most of them, you know, just paying out of pocket, mm -hmm. or most of your patients have managed care? Uh, most of them, I would say, have managed care. Mm -hmm. I do have a, a handful of clients that do, you know, they do pay out of pocket, mm -hmm. um, but most do have managed care. Okay. And their programs, uh, or their managed care tends to be pretty good. Okay. Um, but like I said, in a couple months, you know, they might get a new job, something might happen, and then you know, their insurance company changes, and uh, that does affect our work together. Now, a trend that I'm starting to see personally uh, with some doctors is that they are okay. going private mm. so that they don't have to report to managed care. How do you feel about that? Mm. Well, it's like I said before, uh, health care is not cheap. Right. Those people that are going private are most likely charging you know, pretty high amounts for their hourly rates right. or whatever services that they provide. So it's good to good for them mm -hmm. if they can do it and if their clients are willing to pay and have the resources to pay mm -hmm. but it does put a lot of uh clients in a tough position right if they bond with that person if they feel like that person will be very helpful for them mm -hmm. but they can't afford the services and they're you know they're not paneled with insurance it, it's difficult it's difficult very yeah mm -hmm. so um what what do you uh do for your clients do you have a sliding fee scale mm. are you uh doing phone therapy? Mm. Are you doing video therapy? What mm. are your, your methods? Yeah, I'm very flexible. Um, mm -hmm. I do have a sliding fee scale and I do understand, like I said before, clients do come to me with financial stress. Mm -hmm. So I will be very understanding of their financial situations and I will be flexible. If they have to pay out of pocket, mm -hmm. you know, try and figure out based on their income and other, other circumstances, we'll come to an agreed rate that they feel comfortable with. Um, I have done Skype therapy. I have done phone consultations when necessary. Okay. Um, well, yeah, and phone therapy uh, and Skyping, uh, who does that mainly appeal to? People who are, let's say, agoraphobics, they can't leave their home, mm. or it's kind of an emergency situation? Mm. Yeah, it, I have had that situation where someone's anxiety is so high that they will not leave their home, and mm -hmm. we had to do you know, Skype sessions or something. Um, I've had people with transportation issues, health issues, where they can't uh, you know, get to my office. Right. Um, I've had people out of state. Mm. Um, and so it, it, it's different. Um, it's interesting because it seems like in some ways some uh, therapy is moving towards the Skype. Yes, uh, I've noticed that with my own managed care plan, they're kind of encouraging it mm. where, you know, the doctor can diagnose you mm. on Skype, <laughs> which I, is weird. I, I, I haven't but, looked into that part, you know, but yeah, it, it is That's kind happening. of the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just looking up something the other day that there's a program where, you know, people are going to Skype in. It will be like, you know, 20 plus people are doing almost like a group therapy kind oh, of thing wow. on Skype. So, yeah, it's very wow. interesting. Wow. Um, so online therapy is definitely the wave of the future. Mm. Um, how successful do you think that that will be? Or have you seen much success with that already? Um, I, you know, I haven't had a large population of, you know, online 
clients. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't really say about my personal experience. You know, I, I know that they're definitely going to come out. It's going to be a big part of the future. Like you said, they will work hard to provide the most research based, short term, you know, effective kind of therapy. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it will be effective to me right now. Being in person with somebody, I feel like is still the most effective. Yeah. OK, great. Mm. Um, so one thing that has always interested me is I've heard of white noise. Mm. Uh, when you go to a therapist's office, sometimes you'll see those little white, yeah. I don't know, little noise circles. Noisemakers. Noisemakers, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, beside the door just to, um, I guess, to filter out background noise to keep yeah. it private. What is that all about? Yeah, uh, it's, it's what you just said. It, it's more, it's for privacy purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a session going on behind this door with a client and they're sharing stuff. They're sharing personal stuff that they don't want the person in the waiting room or the mm -hmm. person walking down the hall to hear. So you have this noisemaker. It okay. kind of cancels that out. Mm -hmm. You know, interestingly, I've had a few clients um, who have difficulty sleeping without some kind of a noise, yes. whether it's rain, whether it's uh, a uh, thunderstorm or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they've actually purchased these white noisemakers and they oh. sleep with them. Wow. Um, and it's been very helpful for them. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's basically for privacy purposes. Okay. And is uh, white noise, is it expensive? Um, not, not really. You can find many different ones on Amazon um, okay. or any other website that uh, sells them. And no, not too expensive. Okay. Well, um, I do want to just ask, uh, where can people find you? Are you on Twitter, Facebook? Mm. I haven't started tweeting. Uh, my Facebook page is about to start, uh, Josh Cohen Therapy. Oh. Uh, you can find me at joshcohentherapy.com. You can email me at joshcohentherapy at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Or you can call me anytime at 860-709-9942. Uh, okay, very good. And so what are your typical hours that you see people? Mm. Um, I, I have a very flexible schedule. I do mornings, afternoons, and evenings. Mm -hmm. um, I work as late as nine. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so just briefly, want to go over the suggested readings mm. uh, that you've prepared. Mm -hmm. um, if you can all just take a look at that. Um, and I would invite you to use your local library as a wonderful resource here in town. If they don't have it, they'll find someone who does. Mm. So tell us about your suggested readings. Okay. So the first book that I thought of was Radical Acceptance. It's by Tara Brock. Mm -hmm. And it's a book on, you know, med it's an introduction to mindfulness, meditation, uh, self-esteem building. Mm. Um, it's a great, great book. At the end of pretty much every chapter, they have a meditation that you can do. Oh, nice. So I think it's a very, very effective book. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next book I thought of was uh, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. It's a book by John Gottman, and the reason I like it is because it's based on research. Okay. It's a what research shows to help your marriage work. And uh, it's a very easy read with a lot of great tips and things you can do. And I'd like to just point out that is great because we have a 50% divorce rate. Mm. So ch definitely check that out. Thank you for yeah, that. Yeah. And another book is uh, Love Factually. It's a research-based book on how to meet your mate. And how to have the you know, uh, and how to overcome certain attachment styles, how to become the healthiest person you can be to attract the person you want. Uh, and the last book I would probably say is uh, Mindset mm -hmm. by Carol Dweck. She was a researcher and a professor at Stanford University. She studied motivation and uh, success, and the difference between what a fixed mindset is versus a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting book, and uh, I would definitely recommend it. Well, very nice. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this episode of Reality Scoop and Josh Cohen, licensed marriage family therapist, and hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining us.